it's nearly 20 years ago that you wrote a book named The Last Image. Um, and you had a subtitle as well, named The Last Image. Yeah, the subtitle was Crisis, Crisis in plural, Crisis and Transformations of Modernist Painting. That was the subtitle. So it was evidently about painting yeah. and the last image in a, yeah. in a manner of speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember it as a quite interesting because it was talking a lot about painting and all the crises in painting. And um, how is that relevant today, 20 years later? Well, I mean, uh, perhaps sadly, but it's 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 fairly obsolete today. I would say. I mean, the the, the, the heated. Well, yeah, I mean, no, my, my, book. yeah, my book is, uh, and no. the, uh, but I mean, my, my book was part of a kind of atmosphere and landscape in those days, and it was in a certain sense it was already somehow retroactive. In it came out in two thousand two, I think, because the discourses and debates that I'm referring to, I mean, largely occurred in the eighties and, and early nineties, and th there was a heated debate around the death of painting, the end of painting, should we continue to paint, and, and it engaged a lot of critics and theorists and artists. So I was trying to look into the history of that debate because I mean it's obvious that this verdict, you know, painting is dead, has occurred over and over. So, <clears throat> and at the same time, each time the painting is declared dead, you know, it it rises from the ashes, and, and but also it's transformed. So it was about the crisis and transformation. So I was trying to trace that history. And what I found was I think you had three major crises and transformations. The first was. Uh, perhaps in, uh, around, mid, around the mid-19th century and had to do with the invention of photography. And photography obviously was a mechanical art. It, it now assumed responsibility of depicting the real. So this whole thing about mimesis, about representation, obviously didn't disappear from painting, but, but it became more, more tenuous. I mean, I mean, I mean, why should painters reproduce the world? Why should we have portraits, for instance, when portrait photography took over? That was a, a large you know, a social transformation. A lot of painters reschooled themselves and became portrait photographers. But also on a more philosophical level, because the, the, the idea that there was a mechanical art that could capture the real induced a kind of self reflection and crisis in painting. And, and when, they, when this new art form was presented <coughs> by Arago, I think, in, in the French Assembly in 1851, early 50s, I mean, reputedly, the, the academic painter Paul de la Roche stood up and, and, and cried out, from now on, painting is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been cited over and over again, and as far as I know, he never said that, because mm -hmm. there are no actual records of him saying that. In fact, de la Roche you know, advised his own students at the academy to use photographs instead of live models, because live models fall asleep and they, 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 mm -hmm. they catch a cold, whereas the photograph you can always use that. So he, he, he didn't say that, but I mean, he was supposed to have said that because it was such a good idea, you know, if, if you see the, you know, the, the debates that, that, that then occurred in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, it was as if De La Roche had said that. And you can see, for instance, all, the, all this great interesting stuff that is collected by Walter Benjamin in his Passagenwerk. He has a whole section of photography and painting where you can see how this debate goes back and forth. And I think a lot of historians have claimed that this was actually the birth of modernism because painting was somehow released from its mimetic imperative to capture the real and it could reflect on itself, on the, on, on the texture, on the brush stroke and the touch, all these things. So a certain kind of modernist impetus occurred because photography took over the real. Now this is of course simplified because all these changes were occurring inside painting itself, but still this, no, this, uh, somehow this death sentence was uh, at least had a share in, in, in setting painting onto its modernist path. So, this, so that was the first death and resurgence and, and, or resurrection. And the second one is, has, also has to do with the invention or the intrusion of technology. You find that in the 1910s and 20s when the industrial technology was somehow reshaping our sense of the object or perception. You see it in Russian constructivism uh, where, where the, the existence and the legitimacy of painting was the stakeholder in the 1910s and, and there were all these attempts to reconstruct the grammar of painting and kind of almost structural linguistic analysis of painting. And all these avant-garde groups in Moscow and St. Petersburg were, were you know, deeply involved in that. You find the Opoyas group, similar things in literature. And in, in, in the spring of 1921, Alexander Rodchenko did these three monochrome paintings. They showed an exhibition. 
Um, in the fall of the same year, the critic Nicola Tarabukin gave a speech saying the last painting is painted. He said, there is no need for painting, there will be no more representation. We need to step out of this imaginary bourgeois world, you know, and step into the real world and make clothes and utensils and this whole movement of so-called productivism or productionism. So that was a kind of affirmative end of painting. You find in France, you find something else, you find ironic gesture of Marcel Duchamp, you know, in his, in his, in his, in his first as they call it, the unassisted ready-made, the, the, the bottle dry in 1914, he, he used to say, this is a painting. Why? I mean, crazy, it's an object. No, it's not a sculpture. Because if you look at this as a sculpture, it looks like a ziggurat or something. You, know, you begin to read the object as, it ha as if it had formal properties. Mm -hmm. No, Duchamp said, he said a lot of things, but among other things he said that, well, the bottle dryer doesn't have any sense of touch, doesn't express anything, it doesn't mm -hmm. depict anything. It negates all the qualities of painting that we have known hitherto. This is why it's a painting. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of ironic gesture of, of abandoning painting, whereas the, the, the Russian constructivism was a kind of politically affirmative. You find Maholi Nodge, you know, who, who would order his, his paintings from, from a factory and you know, have them, as it were, ready-made in different sense. So you had all these versions of industrial technology coming into painting, threatening it, but also transforming it. So, uh, and some historians say, you know, the, 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 the high moment of, of modernist abstraction also emerged from this mm -hmm. intrusion. That was after the second crisis. The third one you find in the, the late 1950s, early 1960s, with the advent of, of conceptual art, when conceptual artists would specifically react painting. <laughs> no, but, but as Thierry de Duve has shown very interestingly, almost all of these conceptual artists were producing monochrome paintings in the late 50s. And from that point on, monochrome paintings, and they had no idea about Rolschenko, that work was, was unknown, but monochrome painting was like the springboard to step into conceptual art. So this is the third time that painting died. So, but then, of course, it, it was resurrected in other forms, people like Gerhard Richter, Robert Reimann, who, who would invent new ways of, mm -hmm. of painting. So each time there is a death sentence and a resurrection and a, and a transformation. So. Mm -hmm. But, but, I mean, coming back to your question, is there a similar thing today? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the, the, you would imagine now, now you have another, as it were, technological plateau. You have, you have the whole immaterial world, the virtual world, you know, cyberspace or the digital technology that would appear to produce the same level of anxiety among painters. But it has not done so. It it's, seems as if the, 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 the anxiety is not there anymore. Well, the painters are keep coming back, like yeah, know, yeah. I mean, for, for commercial reasons, obviously, yes, yes. Of commercial course. reasons, and also I think that there's a way of, of maybe approaching painting in a more conceptual way that is yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think perhaps we can say that. I mean, if one looks at, I mean, the, the, this whole this whole book grew out of a of a catalog that I wrote, or I wrote a catalogue essay for an exhibition that was on a magazine 3 in Stockholm and Lucim and Malmö, created by David Neumann and, and Bo Nilsson. In the expanded field. Oh, in the extended, in the extended, extended, extended field. field. That's a certain point there, because I mean, the starting point was this very famous essay by, by Rosalind Krauss mm. called Sculpture in the Expanded Field, where she said that you know, sculpture, modernist sculpture, emerged out of a kind of split between landscape and architecture. So, so sculpture was the kind of void in between landscape and architecture, which is the reason why sc sculpture eventually became more and more emptied out in the process of modernism and painting took over. You know, Barnett Newman famously said, I think, you know, sculpture is something you trip over when you step back to look at a painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and she said that this emptying out was then reversed or flipped inside out in the 60s with artists like Dan Graham and Robert Smithson and others, and these are her references, you know, that they would suddenly think of landscape and architecture as just material to use. And she calls this a postmodern situation where, where sculpture is now free to move around in the whole landscape of concepts and texts and images and, 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 you know, and whatever. And uh, I mean, and, and, and towards the end of that essay, she said, maybe you could imagine the similar process in painting, where the initial divide would be between the reproducible like photography and the irreproducible, the gesture, the mark of the hand. And that division has somehow structured the trajectory of modernist painting. But is there a similar point where this is also flipped inside out and mm -hmm. painting enters into the expanded field? Now, the exhibition was called Painting in the Extended Field in order to not simply 
you know, duplicate Rosalind Krauss's essay, but also because the, I think the idea was more to think of a lateral expansion than just having a conceptual opposition that would be flipped around. And, and so perhaps this extended field now gives rise to a decrease in anxiety. And, and I think it perhaps creates a new freedom to some extent. I mean, if, if one looks at the, 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 you know, around the debates and in the early 80s, when postmodernism was, was the thing of the day, you find the Italian Transavaguardia, you find the Neue Wilder from, from, from Germany and other similar trends in other places. Well, there was a return of figuration. Like to be postmodern meant to paint figuratively again. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, critics who were trained in models would say this is just reactionary. You know, Benjamin Buchler would say this is like a uh, return of the uh, oppressive authoritarian politics, you know, the, the return to order in the, in the 20s and 30s. I think that was wrong to some extent, but he had a point. But I mean, the, the, I mean these debates were very important at that time, and, and that was what also was behind my book to some extent. But perhaps we have entered the extended field, and, and in that sense that, that the, the anxiety is gone, but there's also a, I said my book was obsolete, right? There's a certain obsolescence built into it. And there's another text by Rosalind Krauss, in like, fact two essays, one is on William Kentridge, the other I can't remember now, but, but it's, she says that obsolescence in art might mean that you use old technologies, you use like radios and um, gramophones and whatever. You can use old technologies in order to provide a different sense of time. You can, as it were, go back and invent or as it were, x-ray something out of the past moment and to see other futures emerge. So in that sense, perhaps painting has, has acquired a, a more free relation to its past. I mean, no longer caught up in this rhythm of death and resurrection, but, but mm -hmm. I don't know, not having achieved eternal life, but <laughs> a kind of eternal limbo, maybe. maybe I don't know. Maybe your book can have a resurrection as well. Uh, yeah. I keep, because I have student, art students yeah. that are asking me mm. about these questions, and I, I constantly yeah. refer to your book. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, I have, I'm, I'm working with this publishing house, and they're, they're saying you should re edit the book, and I would have to rewrite it or at least write a new preface where I say that this book is completely obsolete and this is why it's interesting, this is why you should read it. Okay, well, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Cheers. Cheers. You can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say that.